Just a few words of introduction, you might not have heard. Uh, I am a pastor of about 40 years. It was something uh, uh, late in November in 1974 uh, when the Lord called me. I'm the son of a preacher. That, uh, everybody said, you're the oldest son. You're going to follow in your father's footsteps. And I said, no, 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 no. You do not understand. And I've watched him. I saw what he had to go through. I watched what they <laughs> put him through. There ain't no way this boy's going to follow that path. And uh, I got my education and my training as an accountant. Um, business administration. And then one day the Lord with his wonderful sense of humor said, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Guess what? Now what I've done over the last 40 years has been to help people put things that were broken back together. Okay? The first church I served, I went out to preach for $25. It was a great reward to run out there 30 miles out in the country. <laughs> and I preached for $25. And they said, we just lost our pastor and we lost one of the key people in the church and we don't know what we're going to do so would you come out and preach for us? And I said, okay. And I shared the best I had. I only had one. It was a story of Nicodemus. I preached it all over the country because I couldn't figure out what to do for a second. One. <laughs> I didn't say I was good. I just I was just getting started. I didn't know. You may get to hear Nicodemus. I don't know. <laughs> if you're good, maybe I'll share that one with you. I've been polishing it for 40 years. <laughs> then they asked me to stay for a church council meeting. And for 45 minutes, they went through all the things that were wrong. Every single thing was wrong. The windows leaked and snow blew in on the back pews and the flies came through the windows and you had to wipe the dead flies off the back seats of the church before you could even have services. They'd just been robbed. People had broken in, stolen the offering plates. They stole the cross off the altar. They stole everything. They stole the speakers off the walls. They stole the microphones and the sound system. They cleaned everything. The only thing they left behind was the old organ. No insurance. No way to pay for them. The furnace was bad. Kept belching out black smoke into the church. The roof leaked. They didn't know whether they were going to have enough money to pay for the heating bill for that winter. And then somebody, I don't even remember who it was, probably Carolyn Powell, turned to me and said, Pastor Bob, is this anything you'd like to get involved with? <laughs> We've made it so attractive for you, you know. <laughs> I said, I'll do what I can to help you. I've been doing it ever since. And when I wasn't preaching every Sunday, I was hired to help businesses have the same thing. We've rescued and turned around one business right after another, set them back up on their feet. You want a complete list, I'm not going to tell you about it, but if you want to get on places like LinkedIn, you can see my whole resume there, the whole work experience. That's what God's allowed me to do. And he's taken me through the business world into people's lives that never, ever, ever would have ever gone to church. We had a guy named Louie from Sorrow. They made me the shop foreman in a stone shop. We made granite countertops for people. Louie was a hard man. Hard man, bitter man. Angry man. He did not like that there was a pastor Bob running the shop. 
And I worked there for three years. And after taking care of those men and being the leader in their shop and in their business, I was walking past Louis' workstation one day. I'd already passed him. And I heard this little sound behind me. Amazing grace. And I turned around and it was Louis Massaro. And I smiled at him and I winked at him. And I said, How sweet the sound. The sermon today comes from what Jesus told his disciples to do in following him. And I want you to listen very carefully. We all know the Great Commission. That comes at the end of his life. And he, he does it. But two times, he gave us a commission. Before the Great Commission, he sent out his disciples two by two on two different occasions. Once there was only twelve, and the next year or so when it came around, there were 72. And he sent them out with this one message. And I want you to hear it. I want you to claim it in your heart. The kingdom of heaven is very near to you. The kingdom of heaven is very close to you. And that's completely contrary to what anybody would have thought the message would be. Because if you know the area of, of the biblical lands, Jesus was preaching up in the Galilean area. Well, the temple is way down here. The, the temple was the place where you worshipped. This was the place where you took your sacrifices. This is the place where you received forgiveness. And they were very far away. How can the kingdom of God be near us? Let me explain a little bit of what Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples as well as to his community. We know the story of the Garden of Eden in that paradise that first created evidence of what God's plan really was all about. There was a creator God, a sustainer God, and his creation. And they lived in harmony, and they lived in fellowship, and they walked with each other in the cool of the evening. Read your Bibles and, 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 and focus on what was happening every single day between Adam and his Father in Heaven. It was close. It was familial. It was like family. It was like a family get-together every time they got together in the evening. Oh, what a chance to walk and talk and fellowship together. Sin broke that. Sin Cancel the plan of God. Sin ruined what was pretty rich. And so God set them out of the garden and he sealed the entrance to the garden with a cherubim angel. And this angel was a warrior angel, a powerful angel. And he had a flashing sword. You can almost picture it because we just finished one of the newest versions of Star Wars. You saw the lightsaber, didn't you? Whoosh, whoosh. That's only a toy compared to this one. It was amazing. And there... Adam and Eve stood separated from God. God wasn't finished 
but it certainly made it hard to walk with him in the cool of the evening. And the temptation and the <coughs> toll of real life leads us to believe and feel that God is far, far away. From that moment to every moment since, the temptation has always been in the heart of people to believe that God was way up there somewhere, or way over there somewhere, or far away from where I am somewhere. You ever heard anybody call him the man upstairs? You ever talk about heaven as being someplace far, far away, out beyond Pluto somewhere? That's the temptation that comes when we're separated and we can't feel close to God. But that wasn't God's plan, and it still isn't God's plan, and it still isn't His purpose. You see, the very first thing that God did as soon as He started to put His people back together into a nation is He took Moses up onto a mountain. And He said, Moses, I want you to build something so unique it's never been tried before. I want to live right in the middle of my people. I want you to build me a tent. I want to build a tabernacle. And I want you to have the designs I've given you built out so that I can live on one end of the building and you can work in the other end of the building. And we'll be that close together. Now, what I was going to do this morning, then I asked Greg and a couple of them, Zach, they hold up a big curtain. I was going to bring one of my quilts over from next door. And I was going to have one of the little kids stand behind there, kind of hidden behind the veil. I was going to hold it up and say, okay, now, can you see whoever my volunteer was going to be back there? <laughs> well, no, nobody can see back there. The, the old bed covers covered them up. And then I was going to ask, can you hear what I'm saying from behind the veil? Yeah, no problem hearing back here. Do you understand what's happening out front? Yeah, I can, I can see what's happening. But we can't see him because there's a veil. In the instructions that God gave Moses, he was going to ask that a very, very heavy curtain be created, woven on a special loom, and it was to be created by the most gifted craftsman. And it was to have a cherubim woven into it in purple and red. And the cherubim was going to be like the one in the garden, keeping the people from being able to go behind the curtain and be in the presence of God. And they wove that curtain together using... <coughs> Uh, heavy, heavy fibers, very heavily woven chunks of yarn, and they would put them through the loom, if you know what a weaving loom looks like, and then they took mallets and wooden hammers, and they pounded on the beam of the loom so that it pounded the, the fibers so tightly together that each night they would check their work with a flaming torch, and they would pass it around underneath the fabric they had created to see if any light would happen to pinholes left would flow through the curtain that they had made. And if they found any light penetrating it, they had to take apart what they had done and reweave it and pound it even harder the next time so that they were packed so tightly together. And once that was created, it was hung on spools or on a rail with the loops, rings at the top, and it covered from the top of the tabernacle all the way down the sides and hung and dragged on the floor, completely covering the Holy of Holies where God lived from the holy place where the priests worked. And every year, on a designated day of the year, one priest who had spent a huge amount of time chosen by Lot, purifying his heart, purifying his spirit, asking God for total forgiveness, 
completely cleansed of anything impure, would take the offering of the Lamb's blood behind the curtain, behind that veil, and would ask God, who sat upon the judgment seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim there, whose wings were arched up over. They were looking down at the top of the ark, and their wings were arched over, and their wings almost came together, but didn't quite touch. And right on that spot, over the cherubim's wings, was called the judgment seat. That's where God sat, on his side of the veil. And the priest would come to the altar, the, the ark, and he would offer the sacrifices and he would splash the blood of the Lamb on the golden ark of the covenant as he prayed that the sins of all the nation of Israel would be removed and forgiven. Now, once in a while, his work of purification had not been complete. And once in a while, God realized he was not being completely honest. <clears throat> And anybody who went behind the veil realized if you're not honest before God, He's going to know. And when God knows, well, it was a death sentence. And so every priest that went behind the veil wore a rope tied around their ankle. Because nobody could go in and get him. I mean, you, you, you couldn't just leave him lay in there, but you couldn't go back and get him. So what were you going to do? They went with a rope tied around their foot. And they had little bells sewn onto the bottoms of their robes that would drag on the floor of the tabernacle. And as they moved around doing the very specific request for prayer, the bells would tinkle on the floor of the tabernacle, and you knew if the bells had continued, he was still doing his job. When the bells stopped, what do you do? Pull on the rope. Drag him out from underneath. That was God's plan. It's, an un, it's a, a plan unlike anything else in created history. God lived in the middle of his people just on the other side of this fabric curtain. And we knew it was God because not only did he slay people who were in, unprepared to come into his presence, but there was the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night, and he traveled with them and he walked ahead of them and he was a part of their lives. And when Moses prayed, he was turned toward the Holy of Holies, and he fell prostrate on the floor before the Holy of Holies because that's where God was. And if anybody knew where God was, Moses knew where God was because he'd seen him up on the mountain, and he knew exactly where God was. Well, that was all right for then. When they finally went in and conquered the people and came into Canaan, they set up the temple, the, the tabernacle, in various places as the people would capture different parts of the territory and they would move around and they tried to keep it kind of centrally located and, and that was good. But you know over time the little tent's going to come apart. And you can't patch it up finally after you know, a certain amount of time. Ask any of us. <coughs> the old tents begin to break apart sometimes. All right? And the surgeons can only do about so much for so long. Sorry to break the bad news to you. <laughs> well, the old tent started coming apart. And David became the king. He had chosen his capital city for Jerusalem. It was close to his home. I think he maybe even had watered his sheep at the little spring that the, he used to invade into that fortified city and take it over. He was just a boy, and I think he kind of figured out how to get that done even then. And uh, God allowed him to have his capital city in Jerusalem, in Judea. The place where Abraham had willingly accepted God's instructions to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he wanted to build a temple, a permanent structure, 
that would replace the temporary failing tabernacle. God said, no, I'm going to have Solomon do that instead. But a temple was built. And it was set up exactly the same way. You know, it was interesting. I was watching the uh, National Geographic or something, and all of the old cathedrals in uh, Europe, when they built all those wonderful big church buildings, they're all designed with the same proportions as the tabernacle. They reproduced a lot of the things, except there's no veil in the front. There's, there's sort of a, a, a no man's land between where the people worship and where the priests serve, you know, in those kinds of situations. But they tried to replicate it as much as they could. Because God had made the plan. But it caused problems. Because a temple, by its very nature, can't be moved. It's one place in time, one place in geographic space, and it can't be moved around. And so when the people were carried off to Babylon, and the temple was destroyed, what are you going to do? There's no more presence of God. There's no more... Grace. There's no more forgiveness. There's no place to go and pray. There's, you're stuck. What are you going to do? Well, I don't think you can read the book of Daniel and not see that God was with them anyway. Then, you know, right then, just ask the voice that came through the fiery furnace, or Daniel and his evening that he spent with the lions. I don't want you to understand. Having a building is not the final plan of God. And so Jesus came. And one of the things that he showed us was that what separates us from heaven is not a piece of cloth. It is not a veil hanging in a particular temple somewhere that you have to travel to at great expense to be able to see. And it started with as simple as a Christmas event. The dividing line between heaven and earth was pulled open for a moment, and an angel, and then a chorus of angels, and then a multitude of angels, all came through that opening and sang the praises of what God had done in the birth of His Son. And when the shepherds went and told people what had happened, they thought, man, that's weird. I never saw anything like that happen. But it wasn't the last time. You see, Jesus took his disciples up on Mount Tabor. And he had a special prayer service up there. He took uh, Peter, James, and John up there on the mountain. And like all the times they went to pray, Peter, James, and John got a little... Uh, knee weary let's say they kind of slumped over and fell asleep when they finally came to their senses they looked around and they saw three people standing where Jesus had been in each one of the gospel accounts you read it and you see that each one of the gospel writers tried to describe the appearance of Jesus in that glorified state in a different way each one talks about the light. One was like lightning. One was brighter than the sun. Each one of them speaks of it in a different way. It was a radiant light that was almost so bright, it would burn you, but it didn't burn you. And there were two people standing with him, talking with him, sharing with him. It doesn't actually say it, but I think they sort of had their arms around his shoulders, talking like old friends. And instantly they knew that one was Moses and the other one was Elijah, the prophet. And they were explaining to him what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. They were talking about it and discussing it. Now where had those guys been just a minute before? And then where were they just a minute after? They were just on one side of the veil and then on the other side of the veil. And then they went back to where they had been. You see, what is on the other side of the veil is living, life, 
It's permanent. It's forever. <clears throat> Moses lived 2,000 years before Jesus. Elijah, six or 700 years before Jesus. Maybe more. Maybe about 800 years. They weren't dead. They were his friends. He had spent time with them before. They knew what he was doing. They were involved with him. They were intimately working with him to prepare him for what was going to come next. And then they weren't there. And from a cloud that was just slightly overhead, God spoke and said, this is my son. I think you ought to listen to him. Could you see God? No. He was sort of in a cloud. I was in an ice fog up on the mountain yesterday. <coughs> there were some things I said, boy, I sure wish I could see that. <laughs> like a road. The was coming up, you know. <coughs> no. Your eyes were blocked by this, this, this something. It, was, uh, it wasn't solid. I could stick my hand out the window and it didn't touch anything. But it blocked my sight from being able to see him. Well, there were several other instances like that, but on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus came out of the tomb and the whole world changed. Because at his death, that veil, the only piece of cloth that had ever covered the actual physical presence of Almighty God, had been torn from the top all the way to the bottom. Now you think about the power it would take to tear that tapestry from the top, higher than anybody in the whole world could reach, all the way to the bottom in one single movement. And it was ruined. You see, in a Jewish ceremony where they're having a funeral, everybody gets a piece of cloth that they pin right up here close to the top of the neck. And when grief strikes you and your heart is overwhelmed, you're supposed to grab that cloth and just rip it in two. That's the tradition. You can see it in Scripture over and over again where certain people would grab their robes in the, up in the neck opening and would just rip it open when their heart was overcome with emotion. God ripped His own covering off and revealed His heart. And the end of the temple era died on that moment. Now it's for us. Let me tell you how to explain how that works. Jesus was walking with two people on the way to Emmaus. They didn't really recognize him. It was later in the day after they recognized that the tomb was empty and they come to see him. And he walked with them and explained everything that was going on. And he explained all the prophecies and how his ministry had just completely fulfilled every single thing that God had ever promised it would do. And then at the moment that they'd asked him to come in, he broke bread and blessed it, as he'd done so many times, thanking God for the chance to have a, the, the strength he needed. And suddenly, he was gone. He had gone back through that veil. They hurriedly got back together and went back through the dark, back to Jerusalem, to try and tell them, we saw Jesus alive, and he was right there with us, helping us understand. But they didn't really need to get too far because Jesus had done the same thing in that upper room with all the windows and doors blocked. 120 people in the room as it had been on the Last Supper and the evening that they spent together. And they were in agony, confusion. Jesus stepped into their presence and said, Don't be afraid. It's just me. He sat with them. He talked with them. He shared his heart with them. He lifted them up. He gave them hope. He gave them encouragement. He gave them purpose. He gave them himself. 
And when he had done that miraculous work, he just stepped back through the veil. He was gone. Well, they couldn't believe that. They had, to, they had to run and go tell Thomas, who was the only one who hadn't been a part of it. Thomas, you've got to believe what we saw. You're going to be so excited. It's going to be grateful. You just are not going to believe what we saw. And they found Thomas. And Thomas says, you've got to be kidding me. That's stupid. I watched him die. You will never convince me that you guys didn't hallucinate that or make that up just to get me going. But he was curious enough, he was with him the next week. And Jesus stepped through the veil. And who was the first one he talked to? <laughs> I want you to understand, I want you to be amazed by that. I want you to just let it soak into your heart. I was, I was listening to you. I was right, I was so close, you could have touched me with your finger. But you couldn't see me then. But now you can see me. Now I'm on your side of the veil. Now you can touch me. Oh, I'm so glad Thomas was hard to convince. Because that made it easier for me. If he put his fingerprint in the nail prints, if he put his hand in the side where the lance went up and pierced his heart, I don't really have to. I've got the first-hand testimony of a man who said, I'm not going to believe it until I touch it. And what's the first words out of his mouth? My Lord and my God! It's true. And just that quickly, Jesus went back through the veil. He was teaching us if you want to touch me, go right ahead. If you want to question me, go right ahead. If you want to cry out to me, go right ahead. I'm listening. I'm right here with you. I hear every word. I hear every feeling. I know what you're going through. I'm here for you. And I could go through, it says 500 people saw him at one time at one point, but I'm going to go to, to the end. And Jesus called his disciples up to the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple, looking out over that holy city, on the mountain just opposite. And he said, fellas, i got a lot of work to do for you. There's a whole world that needs to know what happened here. There's a whole world that needs to know what I shared with you and who you spent the last three years with. Now I'm going back to my father and I'm going to give you another comforter, another divine miracle, and you're going to be able to do what I've been doing. And at that moment, he lifted just barely off the ground and was enveloped in a Nothing more. It wasn't a concrete block structure. It wasn't made of stone and steel. It's just a mist. And standing there were two guys. Sound a little bit like the Garden of Eden. Sound a little bit like the angels woven into that huge tapestry. Sound a little bit like the guy that was sitting on top of the rock as Jesus came out of hiding in the tomb. The way he left is the way he's going to get back. You don't have to worry about that. He's just right here. I want you, my friends, to know. This is probably getting too long. I'm sorry about that. 1988, I was hit by drunk drivers. I was hit so hard that I should not have survived. I was tangled up in the seat belts. I was strangled. I was not breathing. I was turning blue. I watched and I saw everything, even though I was unconscious and 
for quite a long while not breathing. I'm not preaching Bob Douglas' experience. Don't. I'm preaching God's Word. You heard what I said. This is just my little testimony. And when they finally got to me, and they tried to cut my body loose from what was all tangled up around me, I told about what I saw in the hospital afterwards. But it wasn't from what was laying on the ground in front of me this way, or the lady who was trying to care for me, who was leaned over my face this way, I saw it from behind her. The color of her hair, the shape of her hair, the, 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 the way she spoke, what she did when I started to come around, all the things that happened. Not from looking up into her face, as I would have been if I was conscious, but from behind her. You know what that means to me? Do you have any sense of what that does to me? I got to be one tiny inch behind the veil. Just for a moment, I got to feel the peace and the assurance and the love and the incredible sense of what it feels like to be on the other side of the veil. Now I could see what they were doing, so I guess I was on that side of the veil too. Maybe I had a foot in each world, I don't know. <laughs> but when I came awake in the hospital and told the story, my wife called the lady whose name was on the police report, and they talked and they said, yeah, that's exactly who I am, that's exactly what I am. That's the, everything he said is true, but he couldn't know that. He was out cold, blue. In the Gospel of John, in that last night of Jesus' life, there was a question asked. Jesus said, someone here in this group is going to betray me. And the beloved disciple was sitting right next to him. You have to get the picture. They're all kind of reclining around on pillows and things on the floor. Don't use chairs that we have here in the sanctuary today. The beloved disciple was so close to Jesus that he leaned his head over on Jesus' shoulder and whispered in his ear, Who is it? Now, I want you to know that every single day that I'm here, every single day that I teach you and I share with you and I preach to you and I share from my heart, I want you to know that when I pray, I pray just like I would have been if that was the beloved disciple. And I lean my head over onto the Lord's that's just out of sight. I can't see Him. I can't touch Him. But I lay my head on His shoulder and say, let me tell you what's happening inside of me. Let me tell you how it feels to be me. Let me ask you what I need to do to do things you want done. <clears throat> if you take one single thing out of this, I want you to understand that because we are now the priesthood of believers, the priesthood of people who are serving Almighty God with our lives, with our testimony, with our vocations, with our hobbies, with our families, with our relationships, with our whatever thing you might call that thing you've got with a neighbor who doesn't get along with you very well. <laughs> call it a relationship? No. Call it a war? Well, maybe not quite. <laughs> we stand before that veil as ministers priesthood of God. And all we need to do is close our eyes and lay our head over on His shoulders and we can know 
If we let him hold us in that beloved relationship, we can know what he has in his heart for us. He's that near to us. And the amazing thing is, it's wherever we go. It's not a single place you can go that you're not standing right in front of the veil. And everybody you touch should know, over time, I'm just one of the guys serving in front of the veil. I'm just doing what God asked me to do and asking only that he looks at what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're feeling, and smile and say, yeah, you're doing it right. You're doing it good. In order to begin that journey, I'd like to share with you in a word of prayer. Would you join with me? Dear Jesus, the priests who worked in the temple were a dedicated group. They had jobs, they had professions, they had their training and education, they, they knew what to do, make a living. But in their turn, they came and they served in front of the veil. They did all the things that were prescribed by God that was a part of temple worship. They lifted up the sacrifices and asked for forgiveness, and when you approved of that offering as being pure and spotless without blemish or without imperfection, you agreed to forgive the sins of that family and they could turn to that family and say, God has forgiven you. And when it was turned to take the whole nation and, and believe me, there were some of those guys that had to go in and ask for forgiveness for a whole lot of sins. Man, the nation had gotten so corrupt. And they had to stand before Almighty God in front of the judgment seat right there where he was in his presence and asked them to please forgive us. Their heart had to be pretty pure to be able to serve in the house of God, to serve before the veil. <coughs> Lord Jesus, we ask you as the body of believers at John Day, Church of the Nazarene. We want to be able to feel your power like they felt the power of God. We will even be a little bit afraid of what that means to us and what it, the impact it has on our lives. Because there's no other place we really want to be. We want to be the people who are so willing to say, Father, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Know my heart. Know my evil lips. Put your tongs from the coal, coals of the fire on my tongue and purify my words. Put your spirit within my mind and let me see the attitudes and thoughts and desires I have that do not conform to your ideas. And let me be a pure vessel that carries the sweet fragrance of healing, of forgiveness and grace into the world. Help us, Lord, to be your instruments to change the world fundamentally by the presence of God so close to us that we can feel the breath, the warmth of your spirit breathing upon us and know that you are working with us to impact on our community. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in all things. Amen. Would you